Join in with us as we begin our praise and worship, and pray that you are richly blessed. Come before this person. the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Father in heaven, we thank you again for the blessing of the Sabbath day and for a time when we can come together and focus in on our relationship with you. We invite you to be in our presence, not only here in the temple, but those who are there all looking. We ask a special blessing as they look on this service and as we lift up the name of Jesus. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen, amen. and amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Uh, we'll please stand and sing. Praise to the Lord on page number one in the hymnal.
and happy Sabbath. This is the portion in our service where we take time to welcome those who are visiting with you, with us. And today, you are visiting with us online and we just want to welcome you. Here at the temple, we are going to praise and worship and we want to invite you to join us in that praise and worship. And we are saying happy Sabbath and God's blessings with you. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church family. We're so glad that you're able to join us in worship today online. I want to give a special greeting to anyone who may be worshiping with us as visitors online. We know that even though we're not together in person today, we can still join together in the spirit of unity and fellowship and worship. We want to lift up our hearts to God, even where we are in our homes, to dedicate ourselves and engage ourselves to a worshipful atmosphere, seeing what it is that the Lord has to give to us today as we worship him. I want to share a few announcements with us today. I First of all, I hope that wherever you are, that you are staying safe and trusting in God. And I want you to do both. Um, we don't have to choose between the two. We can trust God while staying safe at the same time. We pray that you are doing that. We want to encourage you to continue to follow the recommended guidelines and protocols for safety and all of the things that have been given to us to stem the spread of the COVID-19 um, infection. I would like to remind us of just regular things such as hand washing, proper hand washing, using a scrubbing motion in running water for, with soap for 20 to 30 seconds, proper hand washing, avoiding touching our face, particularly our eyes and our nose and our mouth, especially when our hands are, are dirty, keeping social distance, especially keeping our distance from individuals who may be coughing or sneezing. Also, when we cough or sneeze, doing that properly, which is to do it inside of a folded elbow with your nose and your mouth properly covered. Also, we want to remember that if you're sick, the best thing for you to do is to stay home. Stay home and treat yourself, keep yourself in a place where you have minimal contact with others and if things get to a place where you're in need of medical attention, please call ahead first to wherever it is that you need to go. We want to especially ask you to be careful if you fall into the category of someone who is at high risk, uh, meaning if you're an older person or if you have some already existing um, or underlying medical condition, especially something that would um, cause your immune system to be weaker, we want to invite you to be especially careful. We also want you to know that what we're doing today, which is having service online, this is our plan for next Sabbath as well. We want to invite you to plan to tune in to our worship service on next Sabbath, wherever you are, either for our live streaming on Praise Vision, that's Praise Vision with a Z, P-R-A-I-Z-E, V-I-S-O-N.com. You can stream or you can watch our um, service later when it's uploaded. Um, usually after service, at least by one o'clock or so, you should be able to see it at YouTube 
at our YouTube channel, which is Detroit City Temple AB Team. We want to invite you not only to tune in, but to invite others. Spread the word so that they will be able to worship with us online as well. Our board meeting scheduled for tomorrow at 10 will still take place. However, we're not going to do it in person. We're going to convene our board meeting at 10 a.m. via conference call, and we're going to email our board members the call-in information so that you will be able to join us at 10 a.m. Also, we want to invite all of our church family to plan to join us for a general informational meeting. We could even call it somewhat of a revised or abbreviated business meeting. We're going to do so online via conference call tomorrow at 4 p.m. We're going to send out another robocall tomorrow to make sure that you get that information so that you'll be able to call in. We're going to be sharing information with you, particularly related to what our comprehensive church response is going to be to the COVID-19 pandemic that we are facing as a world. We also want to um, remind you that because things are fluid and changing, um, in some cases changing by the hour, please stay tuned as what we have to say may be updated or we may have to change some plans that we make based on what changes as we go. And so we're going to continue to make sure we share information with you. Also, we want to pray for one another. Let's pray for each other. Let's pray for our world. Let's support each other. Let's call one another, especially call individuals who you know who may be ill or who may be older. Let us make sure we stay connected during this time. And then finally, I want to say to you in the name of Jesus, do not fear. Do not fear. The psalmist says in Psalm 46, God is our refuge and our fortress, a very present help in the time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be shaken or the mountains fall into the depths of the sea. And again, Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 1, he says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Let's keep on looking to Jesus. Let's keep on depending on Jesus. Let's keep on trusting in Jesus because we know that he holds us in the palm of his hands. He's looking down on us and he's still on the throne. He's still in control. And he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. God bless you this morning as we worship God together in spirit and in truth. Happy Sabbath, church. Jesus said there would be days like this, huh? Amen. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. All that's good and perfect comes from you. You're the heart of my contentment, hope for all I do. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. When I've lost my direction, you're the compass for my way. You're the fiery light. When nights are dark and cold In sadness You are the laughter That shatters all my fears When I'm all alone Your hand is there to hold Oh, you're the reason I find pleasure in the simple things in life, you're the music of 
the meadows and the streams, the voices of the children, my family and my home, you're the source and finish of all my highest dreams, Jesus, yes, Lord. you're the center of yes, my joy, all oh, that's good and perfect comes from you. You're the heart of my contentment, hope for all I do. Jesus, you are the center of my joy. Jesus, you are the center of my joy. Jesus, you are the center of my joy. You're everything, 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 everything. You're my joy in my sorrow. You're my Sabbath. You know, it is now time that we return a faithful tithe to the Lord. He has been good to us, and no matter what circumstance that we might find ourselves in, we must be faithful to the Lord. Amen? When Edward Stokes was 12 years old, he worked at night for a local newspaper in order to help his single mother earn money to help the family. When Edward received his money, he gave it all to his mother, who always returned a faithful tithe. One time his mother said, Edward, I know that you have no overcoat, and you have to walk many miles to go to work every night. Winter is coming soon, and it's going to be very cold when you walk home at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. So I'll give you your tithe, and you can either return your tithe or you can buy an overcoat. I'll leave the decision up to you. Edward hurried to the church to return his faithful tithe. The next week, Edward's Aunt Mary came over and gave Edward a coat that her sons had outgrown. It fit him and was better than any coat that he could have bought. Since then, Edward decided to always return a faithful tithe. When we return 10% of our income to the Lord, we get more than we give. Though many times we receive spiritual blessings for returning our tithe, sometimes the blessings are temporal. Let us not forget to return our tithe to the Lord. God has promised not to forget us. He's been faithful, and he will continue to do so. Even though we're not here at church, there are many ways, there are several ways that we can be faithful to the Lord in returning our time. We can go to AdventistGiving.org. That's AdventistGiving.org. Go to the search box. Type in Detroit Center. City Temple, 
or we can go through the old snail mail and we can mail our tie to City Temple 8816 Grand River, Detroit 48204. Let's not forget to return a faithful tie. May we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you because we know that you are with us no matter what happens. We ask, Lord, that you would remind us of your faith. to according to the power of our God and so we're going to ask that you would just bow your head now but before we do we want you to share with you some of our family members who need a constant uh, prayer one is sister Edith Wilcher the smart family they lost a loved one this week um, sister Mary Butler she's already on our prayer list but we want you to continue to pray for her the Kegler family, we understand there's a flu bug that came into your home and is holding you hostage. We want to pray for you. And then we're going to pray for this crisis that's in the world, for the people not to be afraid and that we continue to have confidence in God who is always in control. So we ask now that you just bow your heads as we lift up the name of Jesus. Father in heaven, it is such a joy and a pleasure to call upon your name because, Lord, we adore you and we praise you and you've done so many things to let us know how much you love us. So, Lord, we just thank you for all of the things that you do for us constantly, seen and unseen. Father, we confess that we are sinful, that our natures have gone astray and we have done things and said things and thought things and acted adverse to your will and to your law. And so, Lord, we ask you to forgive us. We ask you to forgive us, Lord, in a big way because we realize that we need your forgiveness. We need, Lord, the repentance and confession that come with that because it helps us to be more like Jesus. Lord, we realize that you've done so many things for us over the week, that you've brought us through day by day, moment by moment, sex, section, section, second by second, you brought us through. And even though there may be crisis and emergencies and situations, struggles and frustrations and anxieties along the way, you brought us through anyway. And so, Lord, for that, we thank you. And we give you thanksgiving constantly for all that you do, seen and unseen. Lord, we pray for our prayer list that's in our bulletin. For those who need your continual care above and beyond what we even think or ask. Because we know, Lord, that's what you do. You're a healing God. You're a caring God. You're serving God. And so, Lord, we thank you for looking on our list and healing those who are there. We ask a special blessing, Lord, for Edith Welcher, the Smart family, Sister Butler, the Kegler family, and for those in the world who have this virus that's going around. Lord, we ask you to shield your people. Shield us from the foolishness of the world. Shield us from the disease of the world. Help us to take the necessary precautions. And when we do, Lord, we ask you to care for us in a more specific way. Now, Lord, as we do this service, we ask the things that we say and do will lift up Jesus. That those looking on will see Jesus clearly. And they will make decisions to follow you all the way because now it is time to make that decision real. So help us, Lord, please. Be with our pastors. He brings the message today. I ask, Lord, that you would 
and <clears throat> imbue him with the double portion of your spirit so that the words that he speaks will be words from on high and there'll be words of conviction that there'll be words of love and care and mercy so that we can understand what Jesus wants from us and that we can respond accordingly. Now bless us, Lord, please. Please. We ask also, Lord, for the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives to work out our salvation within us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And for his sake we pray. Amen. And amen. Happy Sabbath. I will be reading our scripture, and it is found in Genesis 2, 15 through 18. I will be reading from the English Standard Version. And it reads, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his word. You may be seated. A thief was dying on a cross, and he knew all along that he had done wrong, and now for his sins he must die. And as he turned, he saw the Christ, and with blood flowing down, knew he had found one who could save his soul and he cried remember me when you come into your kingdom O oh lord remember me when you talk to your father tell him that i know i've not been all he wants me to be, but in mercy now I plead. Lord, please remember me. And Jesus said, have no fear. 
Son, you shall be with me eternally. It is for you that I die. And now I know Christ lives again. And he stands all alone before the white throne. With his own precious life, he covers mine. So I cry, remember me when you come into your kingdom, oh Lord. Remember me when you talk to your father. Tell him that I know I've not been all he wants me to be. But in mercy now I plead, Lord, please remember me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom, O oh Lord. Remember me when you talk to your Father. Tell him that I know I've not been. All he wants me to be, but in mercy now I plead, Lord, please remember me, remember me, remember me. Amen. Somebody. What a blessing the ministry of music has been this morning. Jesus is the center of our joy. And we sure do want him to remember us when he comes in his kingdom. As we turn to the word at this time, I want to invite you to bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we ask in Jesus' name that you would come near to us by your Holy Spirit. Cover us in your blood and give us the ability, Father, to discern your will for us and then your grace so that we will be able to yield all to you so that you can fulfill it in us. In Jesus' name, let all God's children say, Amen. There is one persistent topic of conversation that dominates the news headlines worldwide and perhaps has gained a place of prominence in the thoughts of most people. The novel Corona virus or COVID-19. This global pandemic has had an unprecedented impact on our world. According to the World Health Organization, over 125,000 cases of infection 
globally have been confirmed and over 4,000 have died. According to the Centers for Disease Control, there are over 1,600 confirmed cases in the United States, covering 49 of the 50 states and has claimed the lives of at least 41 people. At the beginning of this month, we knew of 70 confirmed cases in the United States. Here we are 14 days into the month, and that number has multiplied exponentially and continues to rise. There's no way to be certain of how far this will go. Some projections estimate that over one million people could possibly be infected. This pandemic has had a significant impact on the way we live our lives every day and has prompted drastic measures to be taken. Mass school and university closings, economic uncertainty, and curiously, the shortage of toilet paper. And drastic measures must be taken because it really is that serious. Yet there is an even deadlier virus still that is not taken quite as seriously. Over the centuries, it has claimed billions of lives and will certainly claim billions more. Now, I'm talking about the spread of the infectious disease that the Word of God calls sin. Today, we're going to talk about its symptoms and risk factors. We're especially going to talk about the fact that it has had the effect, rather, that it has on our ability to live in and enjoy healthy and nurturing community. Most of all, we're going to talk about the cure. There's only one known cure. Our message today is entitled, Never Alone, Part Two, The One Design. I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2, and I'm reading now in your hearing verses 18 to 24. That's Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 24, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. The Word of God says, Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them and whatever the man called every living creature that was their name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. 
And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. As we enter the scene, for the first time, we see that in his perfect creation, God declares something to be not good. Seven times in chapter one, as God masterfully creates the world, he stops and looks and observes that the creation, like him, was good. Not only has God made a wonderful world, but also he has made a magnificent garden, and in it he places a man sculpted from the dust of the ground and made alive by nothing less than the breath, the life-giving breath of God. Here we have a benevolent and powerful God, a splendorous world, a beautiful garden, and a masterpiece of a man, and yet something is wrong. The man is all alone. It's not good for man to be alone. This is the core issue of our message today, and its depth and significance is unveiled as we recognize that the man is not alone in the sense that there's no one around. He has God above him in whose image he has been made and every type of animal beneath him over whom he will exercise dominion, but still he is alone. He is alone in the sense that he has no one beside him with whom to experience companionship, cooperation, and community. It's not good for man to be alone. What happens next serves to intensify the drama. God brings all of the animals to Adam so that he can name them, but the process is instructive. As he explores the creation, Adam's recognition of aloneness is awakened in his consciousness. This is exactly what God intends. God teaches a very important lesson about the nature of humanity by contrast. He allows Adam to discern the emptiness of aloneness so that he will be able to truly appreciate the fullness of companionship. As God provides for the aloneness of man, man is able to learn something about God and at the same time, something about himself. God is the loving provider of all things, he learns. And at the same time, he learns that it is not good for man to be alone. This is not just a lesson about marriage. This is an important lesson about human nature and God's design for us to have community and to be in community. Again, I say, it is not good for man to be alone. I heard the story, the true story of a little girl. Her name was Lori. She was three years old and she was upstairs one evening trying to get herself undressed and she called down to her mom, mom, can you come up and help me to undress? And her mom said, yeah, honey, but I'm busy. You, you know how to undress yourself, so, so, so go ahead. Little three-year-old Lori said, yes, mommy, but even when people know how to do things from, for themselves, they still need other people. And isn't it so true? The wise man says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. 
But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. We need community. As we watch God fill this need for Adam, not only do we learn what God designs for community, that God designs community for man, but also we see God's design for community. God declares, I will make him a helper suitable for him or fit for him. The term helper here does not mean an assistant. <laughs> Most times in the Old Testament, this word for helper actually refers to God as the one providing help. A few times it refers to military aid. Here it is further explained by the words, a helper fit for him, literally a helper opposite him, meaning corresponding to him. The meaning is clear. God will make someone to complement the man so that together they can have something and be something greater than what they have or are by themselves. So God places the man in a deep sleep and performs the world's first surgery. He extracts one of Adam's ribs and from it he builds a woman. Then God awakens Adam and introduces the woman to the man. And when Adam sees Eve, immediately, spontaneously, he bursts forth into poetic song. This at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And this union becomes the model for the worldwide practice of marriage. This is the reason, Moses says, why a man leaves his mother and father and his, is joined to his wife. And the two become one flesh. <coughs> Excuse me. It does not get any closer than this. Two becoming one. But the union does not only provide a model for marriage, but also it gives us insight into God's intention for human community. As I said last week, God chooses to make marriage between one man and one woman the fundamental building block of all human community. No other relationship will have the same oneness as the husband and the wife, but every other relationship will flow out of that oneness. The oneness of Adam and Eve under God then sets the tone or was to set the tone for the relationships of the entire human family. Moses' very next words help us to understand this more. He says, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This nakedness signifies no hiding, no covering, no barriers, not just physically, but also mentally and spiritually, complete openness, transparency, and along with this, they felt no shame. The Hebrew word here for felt no shame is actually reflexive. In other words, it means they felt no shame before each other. In other words, relationally, they were completely 
completely secure and full of trust. Can you imagine a world where we would, rather, we would relate to one another without any insecurity? No questions about what people may be thinking or how others may view us. No need to conceal the truth about me or, no, or any need to hide the things that I don't want to be criticized for or the things which would cause others to look down on me. A world, can we imagine a world of no relational fear? This was God's design for human community. We would relate to one another in complete trust and openness. We would relate to each other in support and love. This is God's plan for us. Yet in the very next chapter, we find a snake in the garden. And we see the man and woman turning away from God's design in order to seek out their own design as they take and eat of the forbidden fruit and notice the immediate and tragic results. Now Genesis chapter 3 verses 7 through 13. <clears throat> it says, Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the pool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. I want us to notice the immediate breakdown of community that first begins with sin-based fear. Because of sin, the pair now experiences self-consciousness, a feeling of exposure and a fear of being exposed, a need to cover up to hide, to avoid shame and embarrassment. The relationship is ruined. Ruined for them and ruined for us. We see what a deadly reality it becomes as soon as the two face the prospect of death as God comes into the garden. First, they hide themselves from him. Their relationship with God is ruined. Then when God confronts them, they both resort to selfishness in order to protect themselves. Adam throws Eve under the bus immediately. He is willing to sacrifice her in order to save himself. Eve quickly transfers the blame to the serpent in order to preserve herself. And at once, we see how community, as we now experience it, began. This is the world that we live in today. A world of self-consciousness, selfishness, self-preoccupation because of sin-based fear. Everyone is busy looking out for themselves. Our ruined relationship with God has ruined our relationships with each other. We are full of fear and insecurity, and as a result, we are easily offended. We are highly skilled at doing whatever is necessary to avoid shame, embarrassment, 
from people and keeping them from having a negative opinion of us. We have learned how to hide and cover ourselves, but the fig leaves have become complex and sophisticated. And most of all, we have turned against each other. We talk about each other. We talk against each other. We accuse each other. We condemn each other. We avoid each other. We hate each other. We are indifferent to each other. And perhaps this indifference is the most sinister of all because it comes across as innocent and non-threatening. It cloaks itself as nothing particularly heinous. I don't particularly mean you any harm, but the hidden evil is that I don't particularly mean you any good either. So brutality and murder can be veiled by the casual and seemingly benign question, am I my brother's keeper? But beloved, it's not enough to passively mean each other no harm. No, God's one design is not fulfilled until we are actively and intentionally, intentionally and selflessly seeking each other's good. God will not be pleased with anything less. It's important for us to see that this is a critical end time issue. The closer we get to the return of Christ and the further the world strays away from right relationship with God is the more we're going to see division, hostility, alienation, and general unkindness of man toward his fellow man. When I saw the headlines of our political leaders seeking to take steps to provide aid to meet the national emergency surrounding the coronavirus, I could not help but think of how hateful, poisonous, hard-hearted, and nasty their discourse has been, and increasingly so in recent days. The leaders of this country have been at each other's throats, and the general discourse has been mean-spirited, disparaging and degrading and we have gotten used to it but God is not pleased this is not his plan for us an enemy has done this there's a snake in the garden we have grown accustomed to the harsh tones, cruel words, and extreme polarization of our society, but it breaks the heart of God. It's easy for us to soak it up and spend many hours just taking it in as though it will not shape us and our thinking and our attitudes to resemble those of the world. We take it in like nothing. We think we're doing the responsible thing, keeping up with the news. All the while, God is not pleased. For news outlets, it's big business. For the political parties, it's an expedient way to rally the base. For comedians, it's perfect fodder to make people laugh. But for God, it is the satanic disfiguration of his divine image. Mankind being inhumane to each other. And God is not pleased. And it's not just America. 
It's all over the world. Selfishness, partisanship, nationalism, and tribalism turning people against one another in word and in deed and in sinful indifference. And it's not just the world. It's even in the church. NAD versus GC. Oakwood University versus Oakwood Alumni Association. State conferences versus regional conferences. Liberals versus conservatives. Old people versus young people. This family versus that family. This prominent leader versus that prominent leader. This clique versus that clique. This deacon versus that deacon. This worker versus that worker. Husband versus wife. Wife versus husband. Children versus parents. Brother versus brother. Sister versus sister. And God is not pleased. He's not pleased. This is the sign that the harvest of the earth has ripened and the cup of mankind's iniquity is full and running over and Jesus, the judge of all the earth, is about to come. The image of the serpent, the dragon, has been imprinted on the world. And Jesus is about to cleanse this world by fire. And there's only one solution. There's only one cure for this pestilence that has filled our world. And God introduces and applies this cure the very first day the virus broke out. Now, Genesis 3, verse 21. It says, <clears throat> and the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Do you see? God finds a solution that goes to the heart of the problem. He covers our nakedness and thereby eradicates our fear. It was sin that made us naked and afraid. So he atones for the sin and covers the nakedness so that more and more he can cast out all of our fear. Thus restoring right relationship and healthy community. Notice it says he makes garments of skins, not garments of fur or wool, but skins. That means that blood had to be shed. That means that an animal had to die. And it says that he made them garments or coats. Moses uses the same Hebrew word later on in Genesis when he describes Joseph's coat of many colors. It's the exact same word, his robe of many colors. He takes away our fig leaves and he covers us completely. With his love of righteousness. He heals the relationship between himself 
and us so that our relationships with each other might be healed. Our fellowship and our communities might be healed and grow and nurture and help and love so that once again we in him can be naked and unashamed. And all of this he accomplishes through his son, Jesus Christ. He is the lamb that was slain. It is his robe of righteousness. He is the seed of the woman who crushes the serpent's head. Bless be the precious name of Jesus. I want to end by reading Paul's description of this new community that's created in Christ as found in Colossians chapter 3, beginning with verse 6. It says, On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew and circumcised and uncircumcised and barbarian and, and Scythian and slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on them as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is God's design for us. His one design. For Adam and Eve, the two become one in marriage. For believers, the many become one in Jesus. A brand new community. A loving community and in Christ community and no true Christian can do without it. It is not good for man to be alone. I want to end by sharing a parable I once read. It was about a monastery in which there were just a few old men, three or four old men, who lived there. And the place was old and dilapidated and breaking down. And people didn't visit there anymore. There were no younger men who were coming to join their order and 
bring a sense of, of growth or a new generation. And according to the parable, there was a rabbi who came one day and visited this monastery. And as he talked with them, the, the abbot, the leader of the monastery, he went in to talk to the rabbi and he told him his, his concerns. And he discussed the poor condition of the place physically and spiritually and otherwise and the fact that the place was dying off and there was no future and pretty soon it would be closed and no young people were coming to replenish and no one was visiting and they had no real impact or significance in the world around them and, and he didn't know what to do. The rabbi said, you know, I don't know what to tell you about all that but one thing I know, one of you is a prophet. And the rabbi left. And in the days that came after, each one of the old men that were there started to think to themselves, I wonder who the prophet could be. Maybe it's brother so-and-so. Or maybe it could be brother so-and-so. Or what if it's me? And as they contemplated this idea, they started to change the way they treated one another. They started to be kind and courteous and deferring and submissive to one another in the off chance that maybe that other person was a prophet. Or, perhaps, I may be the prophet, and I better act like one. And over time, as they continued, more people started to come to visit the monastery. They started to have picnic lunches on the lawn. And they would observe the, the interaction of these, these monks and they were impressed with how kind and courteous and loving and giving and peaceful they were. And so they started telling other people to come and what a great place it was. <clears throat> they started making donations so that they could tidy up and beautify the place. And then after a while, even young men started coming in and asking for counsel. And then after a while, saying, you know what, maybe I want to become someone like you are. And they started to join. Now, I hope we are able to overcome the obstacle of a parable about a monastery. We don't believe in monasteries. But we do believe in the power of genuine love and genuine community to bring health and healing and growth, every kind of growth. That's the type of community that Christ is calling us to be in him. Before we go and do anything in the world, he calls us to be these types of people with one another. And that all by itself has the power to bring life and change and health and growth and conversion and witness and new people. Jesus says they will know that you're my disciples by the love you have for one another. That's his one design. Father, in the name of Jesus, today, we want to ask, Lord, that you would first of all forgive us for living according to the fallen sinful nature that's full of self-consciousness, that's preoccupied with self and self-defense and constantly trying to bolster ourselves and protect ourselves and promote ourselves and to cover ourselves and to conceal ourselves so that we can gain 
the best advantage. Lord, we're just broken and messed up. And we know it's true because we see it in our relationships. Lord, we see it even in, in our closest relationships with the people who we claim to love the most. We see self always trying to gain the mastery, always getting in the way, always causing distance and conflict and animosity and causing the enemy to have access. Lord, we're asking today not only that you would forgive us, but that you would give us grace today by your spirit to put off the old self and by faith put on Jesus. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ to put on his love and his way and his meekness and his humility and his lowliness and his childlikeness. Lord, we pray that you would give us grace to recognize that in Christ we are and can be secure. No longer fighting for a place, but completely at rest because we have a place in Jesus. Lord, reveal that to us. Cast out our fear by your perfect love as we join with you by faith. In Jesus' name, let all God's children say, Amen. God bless you. And now we're going to have our benediction. We pray that God will give us a desire to be one in Christ. For this is the will of our Lord and Savior, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. And now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that they may be excuse me, that ye may be one mind and one mouth. Glorify God, even in the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the blessing of your word. We pray that you will continue to bring this to our mind through the working of your Holy Spirit, that we might share with, it, with others what we have been taught and that we also will practice it in our lives. We thank you again in the name of Jesus. Amen.